uh, you know, the, the truth is everybody experiences rejection. Everybody, every human being. Unfortunately, some people experience and absorb so much rejection, they unconsciously recreate those negative childhood emotional patterns in their adult relationships. My fourth goal is I'm going to teach you how to become your own counselor so that you're not dependent on someone else's therapy. Uh, you know, people are intelligent. Uh, people are teachable. But until they learn how to get free from the negative emotional patterns of their past, they'll never be able to join the present so they can create a future that they desire. Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about the effects of rejection. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Gary Lawrence. Dr. G is the founder and director of the New Life Dynamics Christian Counseling Center, the host of the radio show Life Mastery Counseling with Dr. G, and the author of the best-selling book, Rejection Junkies. You can learn more about Dr. G at his website, rejectionjunkies.com, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Welcome, Dr. G. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Well, thank you, Linda. It's such a joy to be here and get to get acquainted with you, and I'm looking forward to reaching out to your audience with you. Thank you. And I'm so excited for the wisdom and the value that you bring. You have so much experience with over 10,000 clients. And you understand some things that I wish all counselors understood. You understand the importance of getting to the root of the problem. Can you help me understand, help our listeners understand why that is so important? Well, most psychotherapy and psychology and psychiatry, uh, they are focused on treating the symptoms. Uh, if you're depressed, they put you on pills. Uh, if you're paranoid, uh, they put you on pills. If you have anxiety, they put you on pills. That's just symptomatic treatment. Uh, I make a commitment to every person that contacts me that I have three basic goals. The first thing I want to do is help you identify the underlying problem, not treat the symptom. Hostility, anxiety, depression, feelings of insecurity, inadequacy, uh, and feelings of uh, worthlessness negative self-image, uh, those are all symptoms. I'm going to help them identify the underlying problem, which I'll share what I think that is basically in just a few minutes. Yes, please. So then, yeah, so after we identify the problem, I'm going to help them isolate the problem. I'm literally going to take a four-hour session with them and do what I call the life history. I'm going to crawl inside their emotional part of their being and uh, uncover every rejectatory situation uh, they've had to deal with since the day they were born, if they can remember that far back. And then after we identify and isolate, then I'm going to give them the tools to eliminate, no longer go on suffering, no longer go on coping, but learn how to get free mentally and emotionally. And uh, so the book Rejection Junkies was written as a result of mine and Sylvia, my precious wife, learning how to get free from our past, both of our ch childhoods, when we got married. Uh, you know, the, the truth is everybody experiences rejection. Everybody, every human being. Unfortunately, some people experience and absorb so much rejection, they unconsciously recreate those negative childhood emotional patterns in their adult relationships. And we don't even know that we're doing it. Oh, so let's talk all. real quickly about the idea when we go back and we identify the root cause yeah. versus when we address just the symptoms. If we address symptoms, we will be continuously addressing symptoms. And if I came to you for my, my prescription or whatever, I'm dependent on you pretty much forever because I always need that prescription. However, no. when we go to the root of the problem, and as you said, we identify, we isolate, and then we eliminate. We eliminate the problem. Right, right. And, when, and then we're healed. And it, and it makes the healing process a process to wholeness and not a lifetime of coping. 
Exactly, 100%. But there's a fourth goal that I didn't have a chance to mention yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, What's that one? No, no, that's fine. I, I appreciate what you're doing there. My fourth goal is I'm going to teach you how to become your own counselor so that you're not Ooh. dependent on someone else's therapy uh, processes. Uh, you know, people are intelligent. Uh, people are teachable. But until they learn how to get free from the negative emotional patterns of their past, they'll never be able to join the present so they can create a future that they desire. Uh, you know, the past and the future are definitely so intertwined with the present. It's so unbelievable. You see, uh, the, the whole uh, premises of my book, Rejection Junkies, and the subtitle is Overcoming the Addiction Everyone Suffers. And I'm totally convinced that everybody is addicted to some level of creating rejection in their relationships. Okay? And so uh, uh, I'm very, I'm very short-term in my counseling, my coaching. I want to identify, isolate, eliminate, and then teach you how to become your own counselor. I love things that empower people. Right. I love being empowered. I love being able to be in control of me. Right. So I would like to go deeper into this rejection. Sure. Because we talked about how every single person has experienced rejection. But then when you talk about an addiction to rejection, that right. means I'm actually asking for it. Now, on my conscious level, there is no way that I want you to reject me, but there right. must be something deeper that says, well, I guess that's what I deserve, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's all based on the premise that by the time we're eight years old, 80% of our emotional patterns are formed. Okay. What by the time we're eight, eight. by age eight. 100% of our emotional patterns are formed. By age 18, 100% of our self-image is formed. Mm -hmm. uh, I recall a time that I was counseling an 80-year-old retired medical doctor, and his wife was 76, and they at that time had been married, I think, about 52 years. And when I shared that with him, by the time you're eight years old, 80% of your emotional patterns were formed. By age 18, 100% of your self-image is formed. And he looked at me, Linda, and he said, well, Dr. G, what you're telling me is I'm an 80-year-old, 8-year-old. And I said, absolutely. And his wife leaned over and patted him on the leg and said, see, sweetheart, I told you, you act like a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and see, that's true of that's everybody. funny. Yeah. Now, now, when it comes to marriage, I say it like this. Opposites attract. Then they attack. And then they retract. Now, let me say that again for your audience. Opposites attract, then they attack, and then they retract. And I'm going to use my wife, Sylvia, and I as an example. Sylvia was raised in a very strict Baptist home. Boy, they were in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. Uh, they were in all the Bible studies and everything. But her, from ages 7 to 12, her father was sexually abusing her. And her mother was a very, a very angry, hostile human being she horribly physically abused sylvia one time she beat sylvia so bad that she couldn't walk she literally had to crawl and hide in the closet uh, because the women from the church were coming over for fellowship now sylvia handled her rejection by becoming an escaper she would literally hide in the basement under the stairs to get away from her mother okay and so and now I was the fourth of four children, and my father believed that uh, I was not his child. And so there was a lot of physical uh, rejection there. Now, uh, I handled his hostility and his physical abuse by being a survivor. I will survive. I will fight back. So now here's two wonderful human beings. I mean, my wife is a wonderful, loving, kind, gentle human being. Uh, here I was, the survivor. Here she was, the escaper. And we met in college. Oh, it was a perfect fit, Linda. Okay, she needs someone to dominate her, and I need someone to dominate. You see, she was so programmed to literally other people making decisions for her that when we met in college, I, I'll never forget, I asked her out for a date the very first time I saw her. And I said, would you like to go out and have a meal with me tomorrow night? She said, you mean on a date? And I said, absolutely. Now, she was 19 years old. 
And her answer was really sad. She says, well, I have to call my mother and ask her permission. See, that, that's how incapacitated she was. Her mother never allowed her to make a decision of her own. Okay. Uh, she was a very narcissistic personality. And I said, what? You've got to call your mom and ask permission. <laughs> and, you know, because uh, I, I became a survivor. I fought back. Now, uh, I'll never forget when I first met my wife. It was on college campus. I said to my roommate, Bob, I said, Bob, you see that beautiful brunette over there in that blue outfit? And he said, yeah, what about her? And I said, well, I'm going to ask her out for a date. And I said, you know what? I'll probably end up marrying her. Now, four months later, we were married. Okay. Now, that was back in the 60s. But uh, anyway, uh, I decided that I wanted to marry her. And I'll never forget, I never did propose to her. Now, remember, I didn't understand the rejection patterns. I, I, I understood none of this. I never did propose to her. One night we were together, we'd been dating about three months. And I said, Sylvia, I think it's time we get married. And she said, oh, okay, if that's what you think. Uh, that's how passive she was. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that was her survival technique. Okay. So, so we got married, and uh, she was not a communicator. Uh, she was never able to express her emotions. And I would say, why don't you ever talk to me? And she said, well, I do, I do talk to you. I said, no, you, you clam up. You're always quiet. You never uh, answer any questions. And she said, well, I'm not like you. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you're always yelling. You're mad at me. Mm -hmm. And then I said, Sylvia, I'm not mad at you. <laughs> so here you got two rejection junkies playing that game. I'll reject you before you reject me. And so I, uh, I, I was so overpowering that what I did without knowing it, without knowledge, I forced her to literally leave me. Her way of survival was to escape. So you see, I fed her rejection patterns that literally in her adult life, she recreated that she had as a child. And that's what reading that my book, Rejection Junkies, is all about. Okay. Pause for just a second as I'm trying to put my head around things. Sure. We talked about rejection junkie and being addicted to the rejection. And in my mind, I was thinking somehow I am inviting and asking people to reject me. But now what you just said is my goal normal is I want to reject you before you have a chance to reject me. Is and you that don't even, and that, that's right. And you don't even know you're doing it. Of course not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that makes a little bit more sense than, right. than, than me asking for rejection. What I want right. to do is I want to protect myself because right. that is our natural thing is, is self-protection. I, I, I want to be safe. Right. And if my safety means you are the bad guy, I, I got to protect myself. I, I need to make sure I hurt you before you can hurt me. I need to reject you before you reject me. And that is going to how I'm going to protect myself. Is that the way that people unintentionally interact with each other? Linda, you got that right down uh, the line. Absolutely 100% correct. Okay? okay. You see, I was feeding her rejection. I forced her to withdraw. I remember uh, you made me many years ago uh, uh, that uh, she was so frightened. She literally locked herself in our, in our bathroom. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, uh, that's all she needed to do was to hide, was to withdraw. And there was that little girl in that adult body hiding under the stairs in her basement again. Because you see, when she married me, she married her mother's personality. She did not know that, but unconsciously, she needs someone else to continue to control her. I say it like this. In every marriage, there's a parent and there's a child. It has nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with personality. In my marriage, I was the parent. Sylvia was the child. And I got tired of being the parent. But she was quite comfortable being the child. Uh, you know, I'd say, honey, you want to go out to, uh, to a restaurant this Friday night? Well, yeah, I guess so. So I said, well, where do you want to go? She said, I don't care. So I'd pick out the restaurant. we get to the restaurant, look at the menu. I'd say, uh, what are you going to order? She said, I don't know. What are you going to order? Well, I think I'm going to have the hamburger steak. She says, I'll, I'll just have that too. You see, she was never allowed to make decisions. 
I, I want your listeners to capture what I'm about to say. People who are the escapers, the introverts, the withdrawn personalities, there's two things they lose in their childhood. One of them is their voice, and the other one is their choice. They never are allowed to express their emotions, nor are they allowed to make a decision for themselves. Now, on the flip side, those who are the uh, extroverts, the survivors, not the escapers, but they're the survivors, they said, I will have a voice. I will have a choice. You will not control me. I will not be a victim. And so then it's, it's, it's always true. Everybody that gets married, opposites attract. Then they attack. And then they retract. Now, what would happen if two escapers got married, Linda? Nobody would have a voice and nobody would make a choice. You got it. I'll tell you, I, I've had people come to me for counseling. I recall one couple had been married for 25 years. They had no sexual relationship. They never went on vacation. They hardly went out to a restaurant. For 25 years, they lived a life of absolute overwhelming boredom. And finally, one time the wife said to the husband, we've got to get counseling. We need to make some changes. And the husband said, okay, well, go ahead and see what you can learn. You see, he was being passive. You, you, you can learn. You, you go. <laughs> right. You go first. <laughs> see. And uh, so now what would happen if two survivors got married? We're going to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to struggle for Dom. We're going to be, we're going to have a power struggle. I remember uh, there's a couple that lives in California uh, that were clients of mine, and uh, we've become very dear friends. And her husband was the escaper. She was the survivor. <laughs> and uh, somewhere we were together, and the husband said to her in front of my wife and I, well, if I died and Gary wasn't married, you'd be attracted to him, wouldn't you? And she says, oh, in a heartbeat. Well, see, that, that, that's his thats his escaping mechanism, okay? And so I, I looked at her, and I'll just call her Janie. I said, Janie, if you and I were to get married, one of us would be dead within a week. And she looked at me, and she said, well, tell me where you want to be buried. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but that's the truth. If uh, I can't tell you how many uh, power-hungry couples have come to me for counseling that once they learned that one of them, uh, one of them was uh, acting like a survivor, okay, and trying to be the survivor that they're not, okay. Now, my wife and I, we've been married 56 years. I used to resent her withdrawal. I used to resent her quietness. I used to resent her inability to express herself. But she will tell you today that God used me to teach her courage. God has used me to teach her boldness. Okay, now on the flip side, I was raised in a very hostile environment. My mother and father were alcoholics and all they ever did was fight and so on. And I left home when I was 16. Well, I knew nothing of genuine love. I knew nothing of peace. I knew nothing of tranquility. So God used Sylvia to teach me what genuine love is. And so once we stopped focusing on each other's weaknesses, and started drawing on each other's strengths, that's when our marriage turned around. And so after we were married about 12 years uh, before we actually began to learn these things. And uh, so the first 12 years were not that much fun, but, but the rest of them been a ball. <laughs> so. And I, I, as we talk about where you started from and the things that you endured in your childhood, right. both of were tough both of them were rough we come with our baggage we come with not only what we're carrying but our interpretation of it and the way we're going to handle it yeah. am i going to be one of the escapers or am i going to be one of the survivors what what is my natural inclination but i don't want to stay that way when you talked about how Sylvia was attracted to you on, on really kind of a subconscious level because it filled a need in her that her mother had filled. Right. But it wasn't healthy. It wasn't no. good. No. 
And so we need to, you know, come from wherever we are and I need to transform into something where I am not a parent child relationship. I want to be partners. I want to, I want to take the best from you and help it make improve me. And I want to be my best self and I want to feel safe. I I don't want to feel like I have to go hide in the bathroom or hide in anything. So yeah. let's, let's, can you help give us some things? I, I really appreciate the explanation of this is where we started. This is where sure. we come from. As we understand things, we're in a much better position to be able to make corrections. So now that we're more aware of, oh, so that's why I do that. Oh, so that's why that triggers me. Yeah. Oh, so that's why I respond that way. And that's why they respond this way. Now, now that I'm aware, I want to change it. I don't want to be this way anymore. What, how do I start doing that? Well, first of all, you have to identify the underlying problem. Okay, we haven't gotten there yet. We've just been talking about symptoms. Okay. And I brought Sylvia, she was going to let now here's the sad thing. I was a missionary to Canada. And uh, I uh, did not know a human being, went to Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I started a church from scratch. In six months, we had 170 in our congregation. In three years, we bought five acres of land and built a 450 seat auditorium. And then we built, built an educational facility for 125 students. So my ministry was going great, but my marriage was falling apart. Sylvia decided the best way for her to ensure the well-being of our sons was for her to leave me. Now, see, there's her escape mechanism again. I'll just leave the man here, be happy, and I'll leave my sons with him so that he can take care of them, okay? And so I said, Sylvia, I can understand why you want to leave me. That's your habit. And she said, that's not a habit. That's all I know to do. And I said, did you hear what you just said? That's all you know to do. That's a habit. I said, if you stay with me, I promise you, I will find out what is going on here. Because I did not get married to get divorced, okay? And if if I did get divorced, what am I going to do? Get married again and go through the same thing, the same rejection patterns? So uh, after getting into the Word of God, I found what I believe is the underlying problem to most mental and emotional turmoil. In Hebrews chapter 12, It says, look diligently, lest any man misses out of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So he says, look very closely, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, bitterness is not a very happy word. It's kind of an ugly word. And uh, I'll have people say, well, I'm not bitter. Well, uh, I'm going to give some definitions. You show me someone that has an inward resentment, I'll show you someone that's bitter. Someone that has a wounded spirit, there's someone that's bitter. Maybe they have a sense of fear fear or guilt, or they have a sense of betrayal, an anxiety. Maybe they have a sense of avoidance. They avoid being around someone, or they have a sense of abandonment. Uh, Sylvia and I, we were down in El Paso, Texas, and uh, I started our counseling practice in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, we were on our way home from El Paso. And I had, uh, I said, Sylvia, I've decided I'm going to divorce you. She says, what? And I said, you know what? You're emotionally damaged. Uh, I cannot live with a person that is totally 100% shut off from any relationship. And she said, well, I'm not like you. I said, I know you're not likely. That's what attracted us to each other. And she said, but you're always mad. I said, Sylvia, I'm not always mad. I'm trying to help make sure you listen to me. And so there we were feeding each other's rejection patterns again. And here's what happened. I said, Sylvia, bitterness is the underlying problem we both have had. You're bitter towards your father for sexually abusing you. And she just started crying. I said, Sylvia, you have a wounded spirit. See, that's when I realized that no matter who Sylvia married, her husband would become the victim of the second order. Whenever there's sexual abuse in the background, uh, as a child, that carries over into your adult relationship, whether you like it or not. Okay? 
It just, that's just part of it. So bitterness can be many things. And uh, once we go through these rejectatory patterns that a person has experienced, then we can begin to bring all the garbage up to the surface and help you eliminate it. And that makes all the difference. Right. To become aware of where it comes from. Right. Her feelings, um, you are mad at me. I have to hide from you. Right. These are feelings that she had as a child. Right. I have to hide. I am not safe. Right. I'm not physically safe. I am not emotionally safe. Right. I am not safe. And right. those feelings carry through forever until you eliminate them. Right. And how do we eliminate them? Well, once we get into my coaching I, uh, and I get, gather all the background information, then I position my clients for what I call the emotional surgery. And that's where we literally uh, position the person to get free once and for all from the, those negative emotional patterns. Because once they're free from the negative patterns, then they be, begin to recreate, to create new positive patterns. And that's where I give them the tools to do it. For an example, I never knew what the meaning of genuine love was. There was never any genuine love in our family, just hostility, anger. Uh, but anyway, uh, once I began to understand genuine love, then and only then was I able to give that love. Well, but here's the key. Okay, I say it like this. The ability for a man to love his wife is no more powerful than his ability to love himself. If a man doesn't have a healthy self-love and acceptance, he will not be able to give his wife that love and acceptance that she needs. Okay, uh, so it all comes back to the individual's self-esteem. Well, Sylvia was the same way. She was damaged. She felt very unworthy. She felt very insecure. She felt uh, very uh, incapable of being a wife, okay? So by my overwhelming dominance, I just reinforced that on herself. But once she got free of her wounded spirit, once we got her father out of our bedroom, once we got her mother out of our relationship, once I got my overprotective mother and my abusive father out of our relationship, now we can function as individuals who are free mentally and emotionally and spiritually. And that matters. And as you're talking about this, I need to bring one point. Sure. For, for a while, as you were talking about, these are Sylvia's issues. These are the things that Sylvia is dealing with. And in this last little conversation, you also included, and I healed from mine. Yes. It's not just you're damaged and you need to fix yourself. It is, I am damaged and I need to fix myself. Right. When yeah. we get all of the issues that we're dealing with our parents out of the bedroom, out of our house, out of our marriage, right. out of our relationship. Right then I can finally be the adult right. I get to choose. Right. Yeah, you said that very well, Linda. My goodness, uh, you sure catch on to this very quickly. <laughs> You're awesome. Uh, but that's the truth. And I guess what I'm trying to say to your listeners is uh, nothing really changed our marriage until I began to understand the bondage that I was in, Okay. Uh, I, there was a point in our marriage where I said, you know what? I'm going to learn how to love my wife like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. I'm going to learn how to meet her mental, emotional, sexual, physical, and financial uh, needs. And once I stopped focusing on her weaknesses and began to get free of my weaknesses, then and only then was I able to become the husband God wanted her to have. And so you're 100% right. And as you're talking and you're bringing in these scriptures, and you mentioned at the very beginning that your wife was raised in a very religious right. home, very strict religious home. But as we're bringing up scriptures, one of the things that Jesus was most adamantly disgusted with is hypocrisy. Right. 
people who pretend to be good by maybe being religious or however they choose to look good. But what they're doing when they think that no one's watching, that's who they really are. Yeah, there and you I are. appreciate that as you're bringing these things out, but the fact that we're raised in a religious home by hypocrites who hurt us, who damage us, who are cruel to us when the doors are closed, does not negate the truth and the wisdom that is being taught by right. Christ, by the scriptures, by these things. And as you're, we're working through these things, that is a source of truth to come back to. Not that we have to reject it because the people who taught us were hypocrites. Well, uh, and uh, they were damaged hypocrites. Okay. Uh, sure. Welcome to, yeah, welcome to the human race. Ta da. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, once we got free emotionally, Sylvia and I were able to be very objective towards both of our parents. Mm-hmm. And we realized that this rejection pattern that was brought into both of our lives was the result of what we call the generational pass down. Guess what? Her father was rejected. He was totally 100% withdrawn. He was the escaper. Her mother was a survivor. She was one of 14 children. Okay. And she was she had to, she was she was a depression baby, and she had to be a survivor. Well, uh, she married a man that was an escaper. Welcome to the human race. There's the rejection syndrome recycling itself again. Absolutely. Okay. And as we recognize this generational issues, right. it gives us a chance to open our eyes and recognize and have compassion for the people who hurt us. Right. And it also gives us the opportunity to break that cycle. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And you're never going to be able to break those cycles until you understand how you create them. Okay. And once you understand how you create them, then I'll give you the tools to break them. Isn't that (laughs) wonderful? Yeah. As we open our eyes, as we become aware as we become empowered with the tools that we need, we can have compassion and we can even have good relationships with the people who hurt us because we can look at them with compassion and recognize, I know why you did that. I understand. It doesn't make what you did okay, but I get it. I understand. And now because I am healed, I'm okay with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. uh, uh, Once you get free mentally, emotionally, from your rejection patterns of the past, then you're able to identify these rejection patterns in other people rather quickly. And you don't even respond to it. I mean, it's like water off a duck's back. Okay, go ahead and reject me. I still love you. You know, uh, I still accept you for who you are. Uh, It's amazing. uh, There was a time when uh, Sylvia and I, we were going up an elevator at a bank and this young lady got on the elevator, she was very pristine in her appearance. Her hair was immaculate. Her makeup, her face, or her uh, eye makeup, everything, the dress she had on, just immaculate. And when she got off the elevator, my wife said, I wonder who sexually abused her. And I said, yeah, I was saying the same thing. And here's why. Women who are sexually abused, they usually go one or two extremes. They either become very perfect, immaculate in their appearance because they want to make sure that they are together physically because what they see is what they feel. If I look like I'm together, then I am together emotionally. And then on the other hand, a lot of people who are sexually abused, uh, they will let themselves go physically. So they're no longer attracted to the opposite sex. Okay. And so, and you know, we just, uh, uh, the divorce rate in the United States is 62%. And I'll guarantee you, as you and I are busy with each other, Linda, that 100% of those 62% are rejection junkies that have been feeding each other's habits in their marriage relationships. And they passed a lot of it down to their children. Now, can that be broken? Absolutely. I've got two, uh, two sons. My oldest one's 55. My youngest one's 52. And uh, you talk about fine young men. But I decided I'm going to break that generational pass down. And I spent time with my boys. Uh, I spent time teaching them uh, and being a mentor to them. 
helping them understand the triunity of man. And this is something I'm going to bring out before we go. Man is a triunity. We are a body, soul, and a spirit. Our spirit is perfect if we're in Christ. So we're not talking about spiritual problems. We're talking about problems in the soul. The soul is the residence of three aspects of our existence. The soul is the residence of, our, of what we know to be true. Okay, that's our mind. Our soul is the residence of our emotions. That's what we feel to be true. And then our soul is the residence of our will. That's our ability to respond to life's circumstances. Now, when what we know and how we feel conflict, then our ability to respond will be damaged. Instead of responding with peace and love and joy and gentleness and goodness, we're going to respond with feelings of fear, feelings of insecurity, feelings of inadequacy. Uh, we're going to suffer all kinds of physical conflicts because you got all that chaos going on in the soul. Now, I don't focus on spiritual issues, but I do teach spiritual truths and teach those truths so that we can break that conflict between the mind and the emotion. And I, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 78 years old. And even with everything I know, there are still times I have to say, okay, Gary, that's what you feel. Now, what do you know? And I have to disseminate the difference between what do I know and what do I feel and stop responding to what I feel and respond to what I know. It's an ongoing conflict the rest of your life. But with me, I give you the tools to do it properly. And it becomes easier with practice. Oh, absolutely. Practice makes perfect. And that's, and that's important. Right, so, it really is. Thank you, Dr. G. This has been a delightful and insightful conversation today. I appreciate you. Well, Linda, it's a joy to have met you. And uh, I certainly hope that I brought value to your audience. And may I take a minute and tell them how they can contact me? Absolutely. Well, I, I have a website. It's called rejectionjunkies.com. And that junkies is spelled J-U-N-K-I-E-S, rejectionjunkies.com. And they go to my website, and there's a link up there that says the book. They can order the book, Rejection Junkies. And uh, or maybe they might want to send me a message. There's a link where they can hit contact. But there's something else, too. There is a quiz. It's on the right side of my home page. It says, are you a rejection junkie? Take the quiz. There is no cost for that. And if they do that, then I'll be able to contact them and maybe help them where they are in life. That's what we're here to do. Thank you. And isn't it wonderful that we have people who know the road, who can show us how to do it. And thank you for being one of those who can show us how to do it. Oh, well, thank you for being the fantastic host you are and uh, your willingness to reach out and help people on their mental and emotional and spiritual journey. In closing, I'd like to share a quote from Steve Maraboli. He said, every time I thought I was being rejected from something good, I was actually being redirected to something better. Today, I invite you to heal from your wounds of rejection and allow it to redirect you to something better. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed, A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller, You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.